Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, today, I want to present the paper named High Yielding Crop Varieties and the Infant Mortality in China. And now, first, let's come to the background. Uh, as everybody knows that the Green Revolution is one of the most important technological transformation of the 20th century. And in China, the diffusion of high yielding varieties of staple uh, crops uh, um, of the agricultural production dated back before the Green Revolution. And uh, after that, China's breeding scientists joined, uh, worked jointly with several scientists scientists in IFRI and um, uh, the, 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 wheat, uh, the, the wheat sector. Uh, and uh, here uh, is the example of the wheat building. It comes with the following several um, process. And uh, Mm, along with the uh, complementary inputs, high yielding varieties has been a key driver of crop yields because it could improve food supplies and may benefit a broader economic development and structural transformation. But uh, mm, how the diffusion of the high yielding varieties affected human welfare, particularly health, remains uh, remarkably scarce. And um, uh, and uh, mm, the fact is that the uh, high yielding varieties adoption can lead to local health improvements through two cha channels. The first one is the nutritional, and the second one is the income. And it may depend on whether the household is a net food seller or a buyer. And um, mm, so, the mm, uh, paper's objective is tend to explore the impacts of the high yielding varieties on infant mortality over the year from 1954 to 1987 and, and test specifically during the Great Famine, which is mm, from 1959 to 1961, whether the impacts of the high yielding varieties on infant mortality is still persistent. And after we control for the prenatal health services and uh, vaccination, uh, is, a, is the effect still salient? And, the, and last, we test the heterogeneous effects of HYVs on infant mortality, um, like the sound preference, food entitlement, and mother's characteristics. And the data sources come from two aspects. The first one is the high yielding variety data. Uh, it collects from the subject analysis of crop germplasm resources and certified variety data. And the second one is the infant mortality uh, data, which comes from the two rounds of the China of the Chinese in-depth fertility sample survey. And um, it collects several provinces like Hebei, Shanxi, and uh, it has got a community questionnaire and their mother's marriage history and the characteristics of their infant. Um, now uh, we could uh, see from this picture that the uh, infant mortality rate come uh, calculated from the survey uh, follows the same trend as the. Uh, uh, st statistics of the National Bureau of Statistics. And the infant mortality rate drops from uh, 19, uh, 1950 to 2020. And this is an um, ex uh, excess death rate uh, we calculated during the Great Famine. And uh, we can know that the Shandong, Guizhou, and the Gansu provinces has the highest uh, excess death rates. And this is the uh, uh, data we use the two uh, as a, we use as an indicator of the high yielding variety. The first one is the average test yield of maize or wheat, and the second category is the number of maize or wheat. Mm. And uh, here is the uh, descriptive statistics. Uh, maybe we can uh, skip this and. Uh, uh, the empirical model we use is uh, basically the OLS and um, and the uh, and the, uh, uh, and the, the 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 variable on the uh, left side is the mortality is the mortality is a dummy for whether the infant eye uh, 
instead during the year Y. And, uh, and the H5A is a, uh, is a is an indicator that we want to use to uh, show the uh, high yielding variety. And then we also include the control variables, prefecture fixed effects, year of birth fixed effects, and province year fixed effects. And um, uh, we also uh, we also uh, set the empirical model to uh, to, uh, to basically uh, put more control variables like the prenatal variables and the neonatal variables to ex exclude the uh, possible mechanism that the uh, that some some other thing would uh, also contribute to the infant mortality. Uh, uh, yes. And then uh, uh, this is our baseline results. We find that there is a substantial and a significant reduction in infant mortality from the high yielding variety, varieties adoption of weight and mass. And uh, after we put more control, like the prenatal variables, the effects is still persistent. And then we also uh, uh, put the vaccine and uh, whether breastfed, like the neonatal control. Uh, and the effects is smaller, but uh, the maze and the weight, uh, these two variables still show a significant uh, negative sign. Uh, and uh, maybe this, uh, this picture just so show the results that we have shown before. And, uh, here uh, uh, is where uh, uh, we can know the effects from the urban urban area and the rural area, and the uh, the effect is more uh, significant to the rural area. Uh, and now uh, comes to the heterogeneous analysis, uh, and we can know that the adoption is more effective in reducing the infant mortality of boys. And uh, mm, it shows a smaller decrease on whether infant died for later married or more educated mothers. And there is a greater reduction for the people who live in rural areas. And uh, here is a selection effect. Um, uh, maybe the H5V adoption can also affect the profile of their mothers who give birth. And there is a negative significant coefficient for the mother's education. And uh, here is a subsample. We test the family planning policy. And, uh, and also, HIV's adoption is more effective in reducing the child mortality for the family with lower assets. Uh, OK, maybe okay. the time, time is, is up. For... <laughs> maybe you can just say the last sentence. <laughs> uh, uh, here comes the conclusion. and. Uh, uh, we can know that um, the H5V as, uh, exactly reduces the infant mortality and uh, du during the whole period, but uh, the effect is more uh, salient during the family year. And we also give some heterogeneous analysis. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh. Mm. Uh, and now is a two minute question and answer all. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not the chair or moderator. Oh, okay. So. Okay. Uh, Rina, yeah. I can I can moderate after my presentation um, if you want me to do that. I think I'm yeah. the second one. And what we can do is after we've all finished our presentation, we can have question answer session. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So then we can maybe just keep on with the presentations and have some right. questions mm -hmm. and discussion after we have all the presentations. Yeah. Yeah. I think like that okay. would be better. Um, yeah. We'll have then, plenty of time. So I'm the yeah. second one, I think, uh, to present here. So okay, I keep the time again. Yeah, please. Okay, okay, so let's see. Um, 
So I am Krishna Porel, uh, my co-author, Dr. Lee Wen. Dr. Wen, are you here? Um, Dr. Wen um, uh, is here uh, in this session and other co-authors are uh, Chenin He and Uha Chen. Uh, the, uh, before I start the presentation, uh, the, uh, the disclaimer, the findings and conclusions in this presentation are ours and it should not be construed to present any official USDA or US government determination or policy. Um, so the presentation outline, I will talk about introduction. We, this is seven minute session. We had actually 20 minutes uh, for the real one. So um, I'll try to uh, move as fast as possible. Um, if you look at agricultural productivity, it varies substantially across different countries. Um, USDA uh, recently looked at productivity across different countries and they found out that um, uh, in developing countries, um, the productivity is declining. Um, and, and this is true, uh, irrespective of, you know, like you look at China, India, or other countries. Um, and unclear prop property rights over land constitute significant impediments to the effective allocation of agricultural resources. Um, one of the efforts that have been uh, and um, internationally is to provide land titling to secure land rights. And China um, has done the same thing, started with 2009 uh, land titling um, experiment, I think like in Chengdu, uh, China, and then nationally rolled out the land titling uh, program uh, in 2013, uh, and the program ended in 2018. Uh, so the main question here that we're asking is, could land titling facilitate land transfer in rural households and boost land use efficiency in rural China? So uh, we use um, DID and- Excuse me, yeah. we still see the first slide, so. Oh, you don't, you don't see the slides? Oh yeah, now. Yeah. Can you see the slides now? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so um, uh, the method that we're using is DID and DDD and uh, main results um, before, you know, like you, you go to sleep or anything, what we found out was that land titling increases land transfer significantly uh, and the magnitude is 6.11%. And not only that, it also decreases agricultural cost per unit of agricultural products by about 10%. So um, uh, the, the literature, I don't want to go over the whole literature, but um, it's, it's clear that land um, rights would help farmers in many ways from uh, increasing their income to reducing um, uh, cost of uh, production, perhaps by transferring land to those who are more efficient than themselves. So um, uh, again, as I mentioned in China, uh, uh, 2009, the program started and uh, I already mentioned this one. Um, and uh, more background here. Um, here is the uh, basic theoretical model here. So we're trying to maximize profit here based on the uh, total land cultivated and the labor available in the household. And uh, this is the revenue and this is the cost of labor. This is the land rental and this is other cost and this is the transaction cost. Um, and our budget constraint is this one. So taking the first derivative and manipulating uh, the equation, 
we finally get this, um, uh, this term right here. And uh, this basically um, helps us to understand what happens with um, land titling and uh, land property rights, okay? So uh, one of the things that it does is um, you have, let's say two types of farmers here, we, one with higher uh, margin cost, MC1, and another one with lower margin cost. Without land titling, you have this deadwood loss because everybody is farming and the government uh, in, in China's case, um, uh, the government covered the cost of production. So uh, inefficient farmers were um, cultivating all their land and efficient farmers were also cultivating their land and the price paid was that. Um, with um, uh, the price being a little bit lower than the uh, first one, the deadwood loss uh, decreases because uh, these um, farmers uh, may not uh, cultivate the same amount of land. Um, and then um, with uh, tr transaction cost um, being high uh, and land transfer allowed, the uh, uh, deadwood loss uh, decreases, which is in uh, C panel C of the figure. And when there is uh, no transaction cost, then every single farmer is gonna cultivate based on their margin cost and margin revenue, um, uh, equal principle. And this is inefficient farm is gonna uh, cultivate less amount of land efficient farm is going to cultivate more, and there is land transfer between those who are inefficient to those who are efficient. So um, the, uh, uh, we have three hypotheses. One is land titling promotes land transfers. Um, uh, and then uh, second is household characterized by idle land, low profit from cultivated land, where off farm laborers are more likely to transfer their land following the land titling and also land titling reduces um, the, um, reduces the average cost of uh, production. So we use, um, uh, we use this DID setup here, um, whether um, uh, this is whether farmers transfer their land or not and treatment variable is if there is a land titling or not. And um, these are the other uh, time uh, uh, variant you know, variables. Uh, these are uh, the uh, fixed effect um, uh, capturing the um, uh, farmer level characters. And this is um, uh, fixed effect for time. So we have uh, two-way fixed effect models that capture a uh, lot of uh, heterogeneity uh, and also uh, cancels out uh, many of the time invariant uh, variables. So um, okay. using- time is, yeah. time is up. Oh, oh, oh my. Okay, so can <laughs> I get one more, one minute yeah, or two sure. minutes? <laughs> uh oh. I wish I had like, you know, I cannot see you, you know, like if you give me like, okay. you know, um, yeah, please let me know, like in two minutes, I'll try to finish it. Yeah. So basically, um, if you look at here, household with um, land title and uh, no land title, um, basically you see that um, uh, here is, you know, 3.335 uh, more in a household with land title, they transfer in uh, this much. And then um, uh, basically 0 0.441, which is uh, uh, you have um, uh, the, let's see, the, the mean difference is 0 0.03. That means 3.4% difference in land transfer between households with land title and without land title. So this, this value is just looking at the data. Um, and um, so we look at, you know, different uh, situation here, looking at uh, 2013, 2015, and 2017, we have three years of panel data and um, the mean difference between title and non-title 
uh, farmers here, as you can see, is different. Uh, so now I go to the effect of land titling on land transfer. Um, basically, if this one, column one has just the land titling, no other, you know, like uh, control variables here, few, but not all. And, and basically look at the column six about um, when you have, uh, you know, about 0 0.593 or 0 0.0641, you know, depending on what control variables that you look at, but about 6% difference in land transfer. Um, so we look at um, the, we do several robustness tests. We uh, pick 500 random sample um, and assign title uh, randomly. And uh, the uh, simulated value is uh, center right here at zero, but our true value of 0 0.06 is here. That means uh, the effect is um, uh, significant and it's not, you know, um, it's not, um, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is significant. And uh, the main assumption in the DID model is parallel trend. We look at, um, we set up this model and look at the parallel trend assumption. These two coefficients before the uh, land titling of, uh, you know, two years before and four years before, these two values were signi uh, not significant, which means um, the, the treated and uh, non-treated, uh, meaning like uh, farmers with title and non-farmers uh, without title, um, uh, they were not significantly different. Uh, so we do um, also a sample attrition test and um, with sample attrition test, we still get like, you know, 6.44% uh, difference in land transfer between um, uh, farmers with land title and farmers without land title. If you look at land transfer out only by farmers with um, uh, transfer in, it's a 5% difference. If you look at uh, out is 5% uh, with land transfer in is 1%. Um, I have the reason for that one. And if somebody asks, I can tell you in the question answer session. We do several heterogeneous effects. Um, uh, the moderator has been generous to me already giving a lot of time. So I don't want to, you know, go over. We have lots of, you know, like heterogeneous effects and other things. But one thing I would like to point out is this, um, uh, trans uh, the cost of production reduction and the cost of production reduction is about 8% um, uh, if you look at here. Um, and um, if you look at the labor allocation, uh, with the land titling, um, uh, farmers don't go uh, and work off farm. Uh, it reduces by 3%. Um, and, and so with that one, I would conclude and say that land titling increases land transfer significantly. And the value is around 6.36%. The production cost decreases by 8.11%. And also uh, land titling shifts rural laborers out of agriculture sector and increases the migrant ratio in rural households significantly. So with that one, um, I will uh, stop uh, sharing and um, I will moderate the uh, remaining session. Uh, uh, Corina, uh, who is our next presenter? I don't okay. know. <laughs> okay, all right, well, we'll, we'll pick, pick your poison, you know, like go next. Yeah, then I'll go next, okay. Okay, all right, I'll keep the time and we're gonna to try to finish in eight minutes. Yeah, so. I'll try to find my presentation. Can you see it? Not yet. Oh, you cannot see the... Yeah, now I can, we can see it. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so... Do you I want to make it, Corina, do you want to make oh, it full screen? Yeah, just wait a second. Mm. I to do. Sorry. I just have to do that again. Okay. Um, 
now I hope it's going to work. Can you see it now? Yeah, we can see it now and it's a full screen. Very good. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So then let me start. Thanks for joining us today. So I will talk about a totally different topic. I will talk about what drives consumers' food choices, using food values to investigate region-specific differences. And this is joint work together with Professor Jutta Rosen. So this was actually the poster I wanted to present in California, but unfortunately I couldn't make it. So that's why I have a presentation today. And I basically follow the structure of my poster. So my motivation or our motivation was that, as you all know, the amount and type of food that people choose has an impact on their health, but also on the environment, as well as on our climate, which you all know is a very urgent global challenge right now. And consumers needs as well as demands change over time. So here we also have an effect on food purchase and consumption behavior because that also changes. So what do we want to do now? Our idea was to investigate the food values and then find out differences and important rankings between those food values on a state level. We chose Bavaria for that as one of the German federal states and on the national level, so in Germany. We compare consumer segments in both of those regions, and thereby we could identify consumers' needs and demands with regard to their food choices, and by the segmentation also inform policy, policy makers and marketers, and so give support in target-specific communication. So, the food values, that's actually like the basis of our research. It is a scale developed by Lask and Brigamon in 2009. And they developed food values because they were looking for a measurement to measure drivers of food choices that are rather abstract and not very specific to certain food attributes, so that they are generally applicable to food choices. So with their uh, initial research, they want to answer the question, do consumers have some stable set of food specific values that actually drive their preferences? They categorize the food values into categories, the self-centered values like naturalness, taste, price, convenience, appearance, nutrition, and safety, and the society-centered values that are tradition, origin, fairness, and environmental impact. So you could also call the self-centered values the more egoistic values and the society centered values, the more altruistic values. And so far, research showed that the self-centered values appear to be more important in food choices than those that are centered around the societal impact of food choices. We did two rounds of data collection. So first we collected data via an online access panel only in Bavaria in November 2020 and then also in entire Germany in November 2021. And we had about 1000 respondents in each of our surveys. The samples were as representative to the general population as possible. So with regard to the key sociodemographic variables, and as in the initial research by Lask and Brigman, we applied a best worst scaling approach. So a case one best worst scaling. We did use a balance and complete block design. So we had 11 choice sets with six food values in each choice set. And this is what such a choice set looked like. So there were six food values in each choice set. And then the respondents had to indicate which of those food values is the most important to them and which one is least important. And they had 11 of those choice sets. We then analyzed the data in Stata. We did estimate mixed logic models, and we also did a count-based analysis. And a count-based analysis just basically means that you calculate the difference between the times a food value was chosen as the most important and the times this food value was chosen as the least important. 
Then we also did a Latin class cluster analysis based on those individual best worst scores from the count based analysis that I just explained. And the number of consumer segments we derived from the big value. So we created a big plot and used those, the elbow criteria. And then we also computed marginal means and stator so that we could compare the clusters. And then we use further variables to characterize our consumer segments. So now I'll come to my results. This is a broad overview. As I said, we have those two samples from Germany and also from Bavaria. And here you can see uh, the general food value importance rankings for both areas in yellow for Germany and in gray for Bavaria. And you can see that overall that's very similar. And we can see some difference with regard to price. So price is, appears to be more important in entire Germany than only in Bavaria and naturalness, origin, and environmental impact. There are some slight differences, so that appears to be a bit more important in Bavaria. But now I go over to the Latin class cluster analysis right away, because otherwise I'll run out of time. So here we have the comparison of our consumer segments. So we have four consumer segments for the Bavarian sample and six for the German sample. And you can see by the names and the colors that we had quite some similarities. So we could identify very similar or almost the same segments in both samples, like the societal impact center, health concern, price sensitive and hedonic. And very interesting, I just point out some key insights very interesting is the societal impact center segment as compared to the hedonic segment, because those food values that are the most important, those are the, the top part of the circles. So those that are the most important in the societal impact center segment are the least important in the hedonic segment. So here you can see some very clear differences. And what is also very interesting is that in Germany, so in our big, in our larger area, the German sample, we have also a tradition-oriented segment. And tradition is usually one of the very least important food values if you look at the entire sample. But we could actually identify one segment where tradition belongs to the top three food values. So that also shows us a bit that we have a more heterogen or more heterogeneity in the German sample, of course, because this covers all federal states in Germany. And that's why most likely we also were able to identify six segments, so additional segments. Overall, we could also show that society centered values are less important than the self centered values. This confirms prior studies. This really is important because actually we need to create much more awareness with regard to the environmental impact of our food choices. And it also our results point at the necessity to apply target group specific communication because consumers really have different priorities when it comes to their food choices. This broader overview on food values, which we created in the beginning, is good to draw comparisons between regions. But then the Latin class cluster analysis, so the segmentation of consumers, allows to get much deeper insights. And as I said, we could see more heterogeneity in the German sample, which makes sense because we had um, consumers from all over Germany and not only from one area like Bavaria. And also those segments showed us there that we should expect different levels of openness or consent when it comes to policy measures. So if we really want to think about uh, putting policy measures into place, we also have to realize that different groups of people will react in different ways. In future research, I would like to link those food values with the row keys, terminal values, or also the Schwarz value scale. So to link food values with the more broader human values. 
and also include more psychographic factors and variables to get a more holistic picture. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And All right. Well, thank you, Corina. I think like you're right on target. Eight minutes. Um, so next, um, who wants to go next? So I can keep the time again. Okay. <laughs> If we have some volunteers who want to go yeah. next. Who wants to go next? Well, we don't have any presenter. Henning, you are going to go Henning. next? I could go next, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, all right. So let me see. Um, one second. Where is this uh, share screen thing there? Um, So you should see it now, I hope. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. So yeah, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Henning. Um, I'm from the uh, University for uh, Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna in Austria. The program still says that I'm at uh, the SLU in Uppsala in Sweden, but I just recently moved. That's also why I wasn't able to present in person uh, at the meeting. Um, and I will talk about how well experts can predict uh, farmers' risk preference. And as you can see in the author list, it's a group effort involving quite a lot of people. So I, from different university, European universities, as and I won't be able to mention them all individually for the time reasons. Um, so why are we interested in uh, prediction studies? Uh, I hope you all heard about them before asking experts uh, what they think, what the outcome of the study would be. It's a systematic way to elicit these ex ante beliefs and you can use them as benchmarks uh, to facilitate the acceptance of no results and use them uh, um, to inform study designs. For example, that's something which is currently discussed and of course practicing predicting something can also improve predictions. Um, why are we interested in predicting farmers' risk preferences? Well, obviously, it's important for economists and advisors to know about risk preferences of farmers, and there has been this extensive literature on how to determine risk preferences, um, especially in the experimental realm with multiple priceless methods, for example, the Holland Lowy method, the Tanaka and R method, um, among the most prominent ones. Um, and recently, Rommel et al. conducted a large-scale replication of a previous study which applied this um, uh, Tanaka method. Um, the original study considered farmers in France, and um, in the replication, uh, uh, Rommel et al. Um, collected using a standardized method um, there were data for replication 11, in 11 different uh, farming systems across uh, Europe. And um, as like a top on, on this replication study, we also started um, yeah, to gather uh, predictions on the outcomes of this replication, um, which is a bit uh, confusing to say. And our main objectives were to investigate who knows what about uh, risk preferences of farmers, or more specifically, maybe about um, experimentally um, measured risk preferences of farmers. Uh, and from the more methodological perspective, we also wanted to investigate whether financial incentives um, have an effect on the accuracy of predictors. So whether, you know, if we offer uh, incentive comp compatible payment, uh, whether this improves the prediction. So we collected expert predictions on the uh, average choice of farmers in different farming systems, not all, but only eight of the uh, systems in, in, in the replication uh, survey uh, in the paper uh, for one of the multiple prices of the Tanaka approach. So we didn't ask to predict um, uh, preference parameters, but uh, the choice behavior and the multiple price list. And we asked for multiple predictions for wine growers in Croatia, olive farmers in Italy and Spain, potato farmers from France, and arable farmers from the Netherlands, uh, Germany, Poland, and Sweden. And uh, on the right hand side, you see uh, the multiple prices, which was used also in the original study. And we ask at which points will farmers switch from option A to option B in the lottery series. Please choose what you think would be the average of the responses for each of the samples. And then the experts we, we surveyed um, yeah, could choose that. 
And we, uh, as I said, we were interested in the role, the potential role of financial incentives. So uh, we had a number of treatments and the, the scheme was as follows. Uh, for each group of 50 participants, one treatment was assigned and there was one payment per group uh, based on one of the eight predictions which were randomly chosen. Um, there were four treatments and one control, two accuracy-based treatments. So the actual payment um, uh, was uh, based on the squared deviation of the prediction from the true value. So the true value here meaning the value found in the uh, study by Rommel et al. Um, and one had a low penalty and one had a higher penalty um, where it was two times the squared deviation and at one time of the single um, squared deviation. Uh, one of the participants of, in the group were chosen for this um, accuracy-based uh, treatment uh, and the payment and, and the tournament-based where the, the person or the individual with the most accurate prediction received either um, 300 or 100 euros depending on, uh, on the treatment. And in the control, just one person was randomly selected and received 300 euros. Uh, so that was our financial uh, uh, incentives, our treatments. In total, we were able to gather predictions from 561 uh, individuals, um, different groups of farm advisors from different countries, more mixed experts from Spain, but also um, agricultural students from Sweden and also international researchers, which were mainly um, experimental economists and then some other people which we, where, the, where the groups weren't large enough to be considered as individual groups and in analysis. And here you see the um, um, distributions of the predictions of the experts for the individual um, uh, farming systems. Um, the solid lines indicate the means of these predictions and the dashed lines show the mean values of the farmers' responses in the actual um, uh, replication uh, study by Rommel et al. And what we see is that um, there's uh, less um, differences in the predictions than in the actual um, means between the farming groups. Uh, um, I think the two groups on the right are, are the most uh, striking ones where there's a big difference uh, between the farmers' choices, the average farmers' choices and the average prediction um, in Spain, but in Sweden it's uh, remarkably close actually. Um, so this just for the um, yeah, distribution of the predictions. With respect to the treatments, we wanted to focus or we focus on the accuracy, so the absolute difference of the prediction and the true mean. Um, so it's a bit counterintuitive. Smaller values of the accuracy variable indicate more precise um, uh, predictions. And there are two dimensions, the average uh, accuracy of the prediction and, of course, the variability of the prediction. So you or if you would like to think of it in this way, how noisy the predictions are, how much, much randomness uh, there is. So the mean and the variance of the accuracy are both of interest uh, for us. So we estimated a distributional model, like Gamble SS model, if you're familiar with this framework, but essentially we estimated a, a, a linear model for the uh, mean, the expectation of the accuracy, but also for its variance um, using a uh, log length function for for the sigma parameter. And what you see here, there are the other two main results or the two, two main models. On the left hand side, you see the basic model um, with only the treatment effects and um, dummy effects for the predicted sample, which are omitted here. On the right hand side, you see an augmented model, um, which also includes socioeconomic um, if, uh, variables and um, the uh, dummy variables for the ex respective expert groups who predicted um, the, the, the uh, outcomes. And what we see is that there are um, negative estimates uh, for the effect of the treatments, in most cases, both for the um, mean of the accuracy, so for the closeness of the predictions to the true value, but also for the uh, variance, so for the um, yeah, uh, for the, the this di diverseness or the noise noisiness of the predictions. Unfortunately, um, only after controlling for the differences in the expert groups and so on, 
only two of the treatments are statistically significant with respect to the variance, none with respect to the um, accuracy. Um, we did some robustness checks using different specifications, just looking into the general treatment type, uh, treated versus untreated, considering alternative distributional assumptions and also different subsets of the data. And the findings are qualitatively robust and also the null results are robust. So um, there, at least with our data set, uh, it's hard to tell, or we, we can't really say with confidence that there is, um, or th th that there are significant effects on the, um, on the accuracy, but some likely for the, um, uh, on the variance, so that the financial incentives lead to less noisy, less random uh, predictions. Um, Maybe on top of that, um, there are differences between the expert groups, as you saw by the asterisks in the uh, model two. Um, mainly, or the most important one, the international researchers provide the most accurate predictions. Um, but when you look into, uh, so so the average um, prediction is uh, the best. But there are, if you look at that uh, more carefully in the paper, um, you also find that they are a bit more biased. Um, Again, no evidence for the financial incentives have an effect on the average prediction accuracy and uh, weak evidence for less var variable predictions due to the financial incentives. Thank you for the attention for the moment. If you're interested in this, just as a note of caution, the version of the paper you find on Econ Search is quite outdated, unfortunately. So if you're interested in it, just uh, drop me an email or uh, send me a message on Twitter or so, and uh, then we can talk about this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Henning. Um, who is going to go next? Peng Fei. <coughs> okay. 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 Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Fang uh, from China, a uh, uh, VT scholar at uh, Arizona State University. Uh, the paper I report on is the impact of agriculture, sport, and production subsidy on grain production. Uh, and uh, and uh, my uh, presentation is in five parts. And uh, uh, the first part is introduction and the background. In 24, China began offering direct subsidy to farmers. Uh, but however, the, uh, the subsidies are mainly based, based on the uh, control land area and the area of current production. The mismatch of the agriculture uh, subsidy become more and more uh, severe. As a result, the effect of agriculture subsidy uh, policy on uh, production is much lower than uh, expected. Uh, recognize the mismatch of the policy and ensure self uh, sufficiency, uh, sufficiency uh, China began uh, reforming agriculture subsidy in 2030. Uh, as you can see, uh, the first one, uh, this, uh, this three subsidy, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this three direct subsidy have been uh, uh, emerged uh, into one renamed agriculture, uh, sport and production subsidy. And from the uh, table one, uh, it is clearly uh, that a part of the uh, subsidy was given to uh, to the operator who planted uh, grain and a large scale. Uh, it is rep uh, reflects uh, who grew grain sport first. Uh, and in general, my paper aim to analyze the influence of the new subsidy uh, on grain production. Uh, even through the much public money is uh, dedicated to the grain subsidy program, uh, uh, but the different scholars have different points. Uh, and the uh, impact of the program uh, uh, remain unclear. Uh, and it, it, it is why we are uh, focused on this, uh, the question. Uh, the second part is the analy uh, analytical uh, framework. Uh, in, in general, the imperfection in credit level and uh, market always constrain the production, the design of farmers. Uh, agriculture subsidy is usually used to stimulate agricultural production. And firstly, the subsidy can help uh, 
relieve the farmers' liquid liquidity constraints and uh, stimulate the farmer scale. And uh, secondly, the uh, subsidy encourage farmers to heal labor or accuse agriculture supplies, uh, which helps them to enlarge these operations. Uh, but uh, but suddenly the uh, potential uh, competition, uh, competition, um, the uh, the uh, capitalization of the payments in land rent uh, may uh, dilute the uh, policy effect. Uh, well, part of the subsidy may uh, lead to the uh, rent uh, the land rent. Uh, they, but they can still stimulate uh, stimulate agricultural production. Uh, from the uh, discussing board. It can be concluded that the new agricultural subsidy can encourage farmers to uh, increase the uh, green crop area. Uh, and the third part uh, is the date and the imperial study. Our date comes from uh, China Rural Household Panel Survey, uh, and uh, it's a national survey of Chinese, uh, Chinese household organi organized by Zhejiang University. But we only uh, use uh, 2000, uh, 2015 and uh, 2017 uh, dates in our study. Uh, to evaluate the, the effect of the agriculture subsidy on uh, green product, uh, production, we employed the DIB with the effect, of, uh, effect regulation, uh, and the model shows below. Uh, and the fourth part is, is estimation results. Uh, as uh, as you uh, as you can see the table three uh, by uh, by adding uh, control uh, variable step by step uh, the regulation result uh, consists that uh, agriculture subsidy significantly increase uh, crop plant area uh, the uh, the result suggests that the new agriculture subsidy increase nearly uh, uh, nearly seven percent of uh, uh, so error of the uh, of the grain, um, and uh, we also um, conduct a rich, a rich set of the robust tests for this result. Uh, first of all, uh, we uh, we uh, test the externality uh, of the DID matters. Uh, you can see a table four, uh, the relationship between the soil error and the farmers' uh, group application is not significantly uh, before the implement of the subsidy policy. Uh, and it it mean and mean that the soil area doesn't determine by the simple growth. And uh, secondly, we uh, test the common trend uh, 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 and uh, due to uh, lack of the uh, data, uh, uh, and we um, we can't use the history date to examine the common trend, uh, but refer to other papers. We use the uh, Farmers green crop so error in 2015 and as uh, explained uh, uh, variable and the whether the farmer belong to the treatment crop uh, in 2017 as the uh, um, uh, experiment variable. Uh, as uh, as shown in table uh, five, the uh, the green crop uh, plant error uh, between uh, between the uh, experiment and uh, uh, control crop was. Uh, was well, similar in the absence of the policy. And finally, um, also, uh, in, uh, other policies may, uh, may influence uh, farmers' behavior, uh, which will cause estimated bears. Uh, so, so, we, uh, so we have to exclude the full provides that uh, implement the co-temporary uh, storage policy in form at, at, at the same time, uh, the result uh, in table six uh, are still robust. Uh, and furthermore, uh, we uh, we also want to uh, want to know how the how the agriculture subsidy uh, increase the planted uh, green uh, crop. Uh, uh, at, uh, at one farmer on, on one hand, he, he he can enlarge this uh, rental land. On the other hand, they also can change the planting. A structure to uh, increase this uh, uh, crop area, and the uh, uh, table uh, table uh, six uh, show uh, uh, show that the new subsidy policy uh, promotes uh, the green crop so area by uh, increasing farmers' rental in cultivated land uh, rather than uh, changing this planting structure. Uh, uh, 
and in, uh, in addition, as a, a large country, uh, China farmers and the regions show different, uh, uh, show different, uh, and uh, uh, the effect of policy may uh, may may uh, may vary across those different. Uh, so we meet a uh, uh, analysis from the perspective of the uh, crop type and uh, re uh, regional difference. Uh, uh, results show uh, show uh, the table. Uh, Eight and table uh, nine indicate that the subsidy policy uh, uh, positively impact uh, food crop uh, grower than better than the mixed crop grower. Uh, and compared to the central and the western uh, regions, uh, the impact of subsidy is uh, mainly on the uh, uh, eastern region. Uh, uh, and to the, uh, to the end of my, uh, uh, my presentation, uh, I'd, I'd like to make a summary. Uh, China's new agricultural subsidy policy uh, affects uh, growing crop uh, uh, area significantly. Uh, the result also uh, still robust after a series of tests. Uh, the agriculture subsidy policy merely encourage farmers to increase this uh, Grain crop uh, area by uh, renting more land, uh, rather than uh, uh, restructuring this this crop. Uh, the subsidy policy positively uh, impact food crop grower rather than the mixed crop grower. Uh, com uh, compared to the uh, central and the, uh, western region, the impact of subsidy is mainly uh, on the eastern region. Uh, as, as it's my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you, Ping Fei. Uh, next presenter. Or we're the only uh, Lang Zhong Shi. Are you presenter? Okay, so it looks like uh, the um, Li Wen, Dr. Li Wen is my collaborator, so he's not the presenter. Um, so it looks like we're the um, only presenters here. Um, so we can start um, question and answer session. Um, I can start um, question uh, to Corina. Uh, Corina, like, how did you? Um, segment these different consumers. Um, I see that, you know, like you, uh, the best and worst um, uh, ranking. And then like, you know, how did you segment the, um, segment different consumers? Okay, so basically, as I said, um, so we have those 11 food values. And then from the best worst scaling, I had one score for each individual for each food value. So I could see for each individual how important. So you have one zero and then like, you know, you calculate the sum and then, uh, or you do that or like, you know, you use only those people who say, uh, this is my, you know, uh, best preference. And then like, you know, you choose, uh, those people who say their, you know, best preference is that particular characteristics. So for, actually I have for each respondent, one value for each food value. And based on all those values, I then did that in class, cluster analysis and data. So yeah, it's basically on how important they rank those food values. You could okay. actually also do it because I did some uh, mixed logic estimations as well. So I could have also done the Latin class cluster analysis based on the estimates from the mixed logic model. But it's in general, it's the same concept or idea. So segmenting those people on how important they find those food values. Okay. And so your graph showed, um, I can't remember the 
graph, but um, you mentioned that tradition, environment, and um, country of origin is not that important, right? For German and Bavaria, both. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, like, you know, price is not important. I cannot remember what was the most important thing. Taste. Taste was Taste. Just the large distance, the most important food value. I mean, that somehow yeah. makes sense because if you don't like something, you most likely won't purchase it. But, but in other countries, actually, like in the United States, in some recent survey, safety was the most important food value. Yeah. And mm. price is always on like rank three or four in most surveys that I have seen so far. But maybe right. that, yeah. Huh. Interesting. So I can ask another question to Henning. Um, Henning, like uh, the, the probability you have Probability, um, you know, the choice, the, the two circles that you showed, uh, the switching point from 30, 70, uh, winning 30%, not winning 70, to 10 to 90. In, in all cases, your um, uh, award amount or the, the amount that they are going to win is 300 euro. Is that right? Uh, yeah, should be. I have to admit that I was not involved in the replication, but it's essentially taken from the Tanaka. I think, the, of course, the values are adjusted, but it's uh, the, the standard approach, yeah. Okay. So yeah. how, you know, like the, the question, um, uh, it's a very interesting, like, and I have to read your paper. I've not read your paper. But um, the, the calculation of risk, um, it's a very challenging. Like, you know, um, in, in empirical research, when you go out in, in the field, you know, like you just asked, do you, um, uh, my friend here, Lewin, um, he, um, I collaborated with some people at South Sinai University and we would ask question you know, like about the gambling habit and other things, you know, to measure the risk, um, risk, um, you know, averseness. And some other people use Delphi method. But, you know, based on your analysis, um, what, you know, like what method should we use to measure risk um, of farmers? Um. <laughs> that's uh, that's of course an important question, but it's actually not really the core of our analysis because we don't really consider alternative methods. We just look into what what experts or other researchers think how farmers would respond in this uh, given thing. I mean, there is this uh, literature about this uh, about how how to design these risk elicitation tasks. Um, but I have to admit that at the moment, I don't really have a, a substantiated opinion on what to, what to choose. Okay. I, I got yeah. you. Yeah, so, so like, you know, if we go with uh, farmers, or experts in Sweden, they are better predictor of farmers behavior than other countries right why, why is that like why do you think like you know those experts in sweden are so good at predicting you know like uh, uh the behavior that's that's a question where i also don't really have an answer i mean when if you if you remember the if you remember the 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 graph uh or the figure that um they're actually more or less not more or less, but that, that actually the predict the average predictions don't really differentiate that much between the samples. So uh, it could be that it's simply that um, farmers in Sweden behave the way experts generally think farmers behave uh, by chance. I'm not sure if there's really a strong argument for why this is on on a theoretical basis. Yeah. Um, 
because they, they this the, apart from the country those i mean what what one could say is apart from the country they are our uh, um arable farmers so probably what most people have in mind that when they think about farmers if you think about spain where it's like more like permaculture that there the differences maybe are different you know come from the from the production systems more but not so much from the country i would say but that's of mm. course speculation to some, to some extent that's gotcha. gotcha. that's interesting like you know um thank you i have a question for you thank you are you there oh yeah 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 okay. so so you know like um we we published one paper about uh subsidy okay. in china and um what i saw was um uh, farmers switching from um uh, from food crop to more specialty crops like you know vegetables and fruits um do, do you i don't know like you know i don't see that one like you were just looking at the impact of subsidies uh on on different things there but like in, did you see the switch um if you know like uh, uh you have direct subsidies for grants um you, i think you showed corn um but like you know um if subsidies um i don't know if you did this one or not subsidies are to go to farmers with irrespective of whatever they are growing would they have tendency to grow more specialty crops like you know fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. compared to field crops like you know corn rice and other things mm. uh, yeah yeah you know the uh, uh, in china uh, many many farmer uh, 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 live his uh, farmland uh, and uh, he will transport uh, tra transport his farm uh, but but the old subsidy uh, it did, uh, it doesn't go, uh, give the trans trans in farm uh, the, the 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 farmers, uh, but this um, we focused on the uh, new uh, subsidy uh, in two thousand sixteen. Uh, 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 China government uh, uh, gave more uh, uh, the the new subsidy gave more uh, the uh, the subsidy to the uh, to the farmer. Uh, trans trans in uh turning farm uh so um so you know in, in china uh, uh the 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 uh, uh and uh, every developing country have uh, imperfection uh there's a uh, uh, land market the 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 the, 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 uh, the uh labor market but if if the farmer uh trying farmer uh um, have more uh, subsidy he, he can uh, enlarge this uh, uh, land uh, because because uh, because because he, he he lack of the money uh, it's a fact uh, so so the government make a uh, reform or this uh, uh, this uh, subsidy uh, policy uh, mm -hmm. yeah so okay um, your uh, question about your analysis. Um, uh, we use the same data that you used um, in our presentation. Um, mm. So um, you have panel data, right? So how did you test for attrition? Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, I only so, so you have 11, 13, uh, 15, and 17 data, right? So mm. if you look at um, that same data, 13, yeah. you have um, 8,932 observations. 2015, you have 11,654 observations. 17, you have 12,732 observations. So uh, how many observations that you had and did you look for, um, uh, did you test for attrition, sample attrition bias? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I, 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 um, our, our data are clean. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the people who uh, didn't have the farmland, uh, or the, uh, or the, uh, or, or the, so, so it's, 
so 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 uh, so we uh, uh, we clean the uh, the 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 farm, uh, the um the simple uh, uh the the household uh, don't have uh farmland uh you, you know every in, in China every uh farmer house household has has a con uh, has a, a contra uh, has has land come from uh, the uh, government uh the the village the government uh, so I clean the the the, the uh, the farmer who don't have the uh, uh, the, the, the yeah the no I I understand you did that one but like you know going from when you made this panel data I assume you mm. have panel data yeah um some of the farmers that were surveyed in thirteen they were not surveyed in fifteen and seventeen so mm. uh, my question is. Did you do attrition sample attrition test? Um, hmm. If you did not, then it's okay. Like you know, you may want to consider doing we, it. We, we, but, we only we only have two years. You know, uh, in the two thousand fifteen, I I I I see the the paper you your presentation uh, use the uh, uh, we, we, we have the, 13, 15, 17, We didn't yeah, use eleven. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 uh, we uh, uh, for for my for my paper uh, the two thousand fifteen don't have the uh, the, the this question about the uh, production subsidy uh, subsidy. So I have uh, to only use the two years. Uh, just, uh, but but uh, I have read other people. He, he also um, have two years. Uh, he use the same way. We we follow this uh, study. Dr. Wen, what do you think about that? Are you there? Oh, yes, Professor. Okay. Uh, um, uh, I also have a question. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, you, maybe you can test whether the attrition number have a systematic difference. Mm. Yeah, I, I think you can test um, whether the, the number uh, you dropped have different uh, have a systematic um, difference if mm -hmm. if um, the, the attrition number have a systematic difference your your results may be biased so i think yeah. uh, you better test uh, the, um, the the nature of the attrition number also i have another question um uh, as um, Professor Porel asked you, um, if you switch the um, uh, switch the rent, uh, um, who gets who gets the rent? If the farmer um, uh, gets the rent, or the renter who, who transfer in the land gets the rent, um, what what are the um, difference between the rent? Um, whether the um, well, the uh, agricultural subsidy affects land transfer. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, policy of China, uh, the, the new uh, policy of China, uh, uh, they, uh, they they want the uh, uh, they plan to uh, the subsidy more subsidy give to the uh, uh, the the larger the larger land larger of uh, larger farmers. Uh, you know China's farmer is too uh, is too small, and uh, uh, in our study uh, we uh, have this question, and uh, we uh, you know uh, I, I I see in the background um, uh, the new subsidy uh, uh, contain two uh, two departments. The 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 uh, the the, fir the first department is also if to the all the all the farmer have the control land, but in the other part. The pack the subsidy he uh, the uh, give to the more the uh, uh, big farmers. Uh, it, it's 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 the government's uh, the policy, uh, and uh, we use the uh, two uh, two years uh, difference the uh, the subsidy month uh, the amount of subsidy the difference. Uh, if the wow. uh, subsidy uh, uh, the the amount is uh, more than 100 if if, if, if one farmer he uh, uh, received the subsidy last year and this year uh, this year uh, uh, it's a, if the the the, the, uh, the different the different uh, 
more than 100 uh, even more, uh, more uh, uh, it, uh, I think he uh, the, the farmer will uh, receive uh, is receive the uh, new subsidy. It's, it... Oh, okay. So yeah, uh, you you know in, in now uh, in our uh, uh, public all 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 of the public uh, debt uh, don't have uh, uh, focus on this uh, this uh, this new subsidy question. So so we have to use uh, different ways to. Uh, to solve this question, but but who gets the subsidy money? Like you know, if uh, you have a let's say you have a farm, and mm. you transfer to somebody else, mm. to you know, like you mentioned in in like in, at least in the United States, mm. the yes. effect of subsidy is increase in rent, you know, mm. charge that mm. you know like um, the landowner charges more to renters mm. if you look at mm. you know the effect of subsidy so mm. the question is um who gets that you know subsidy money the grower or the initial you know person who got the land contract from collecting who gets that subsidy mm. uh, uh you know uh, in every year the uh, subsidy will uh, give to the uh, farmer uh, in the uh, 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 in the May months. Uh, the, 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 the the policy uh, will will every every year will will come. So uh, when when the farmer want to uh, receive more subsidy, so he have to uh, to pull, uh, to to green more uh, uh, to grow more green to plant more green. You know this subsidy uh, in, uh, for the China uh, the, the the China government. He want to uh, the farmer to uh, to 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 plant more green. Uh, so uh, so the subsidy uh, in the local local government he will give the subsidy to the uh, to the to the to the farmers or the other company. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, you if you uh, plant more green, you will. Uh, receive the uh, subsidy. Uh, you 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 pay more. You receive more. It, 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 that, that's that's okay, no, uh, I, I I got that. Yeah. I still I didn't get the answer, but that's that's okay. Maybe Doctor <laughs> One can follow up with you and and get the answer from you. Um, uh, Corinna, one question to you. Um, the in in Germany or Bavaria. Um, is there like in anything, I mean, like in, in, in the United States, we have organic food, but we do not have, you know, sustainably grown or something like that. Do you guys have food leveling? Like, you know, it's grown using climate smart agriculture technology or, you know, uh, uh, no till, anything like that. I, we have only like, you know, organically certified, but, you know, nothing else. Um, so it may be um, it may be that you know because they are not seeing how it's grown um, other than like you know the organic certification uh, that's why like you know the environmental um, you know preference that you have is in the lower you know la lower part of the curve compared to other characteristics. So you mean because they don't see it like on labels yeah. or anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It might be possible, but actually those food values go, try to be a bit more abstract. So it's not really, it's more asking people what they are concerned about when they purchase food. I think it's just that the priorities are a bit different. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that you first look for taste and safety and price and then once all this is covered, you also go for environmental impact. Or maybe you have some products where you specifically look for environmental impact, but be asked for food in general. So not, maybe it's different if you maybe go purchasing some specific food item, you are more concerned about the environmental impact than for some other food items. But this was really, yeah, as I said, what Glask and Brigham aimed at doing was to have like a very broad and abstract 
set of food values. Um, yeah, we did study in the United States and looking at, you know, not the consumer's behavior, but produ producer's behavior, farmer's behavior. And um, many farmers, you know, like when we asked, do you, you know, what is your most uh, important, like, you know, criteria for um, uh, producing, you know, like in this case, we ask question about precision agriculture and something that, you know, maybe would be of interesting uh, to Henning, um, that we ask why farmers adopt precision agriculture. And many of the people said, Profit, right? So number one is profit. Maybe in your case, you know, you're looking at from consumer side, you know, uh, you still didn't see like, you know, price as the important factor. But the another second factor that we look at, what is the most important for them to adopt better technology? It is um, environment. So they are concerned about the environment, and then we also asked, you know, other other factors and. Many farmers said that they uh, want to be at the top of the technology, right? So they, they don't want their farmers to use really good technology and they're like, you know, still using old tractor and, you know, uh, other things. They want to use the best technology available out there. So um, we, you know, we didn't do the, we published this paper in computer and electronics in the agriculture. We didn't, we thought like initially maybe like, you know, segmenting based on, you know, their preference profit or environment or, you know, being at the state of the technology. But, um, uh, uh, but still like, you know, profit um, for farmers, you know, like from producer side, it's always profit. Um, I didn't see that in consumer side, you know, like consumer side, in your case, it's a test rather than the price. So that, that was interesting to me. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not familiar with food, food, you know, economics, literature, but I wonder, like, you know, if you look at across countries, you mentioned that, you know, that's true, even if you go to other countries. I, I guess that's what you said, but I cannot remember if you, that's exactly what you said. Um, uh, what, what about other countries? You know, you said like test always is the top in the preference category. Is that true? Yeah, so for Germany, at least for Germany and Bavaria, we have taste as the most important. Yeah. And I think it's really important to also incorporate that into communication strategies. So, because that is really like the number one priority. And like I said, in the United States, and I know a study from Norway, safety was the most important. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not sure if I remember that correctly, but also nutrition was in other countries more important than in Germany. Mm -hmm. So that people look for the nutritional values of a product. Yeah, so it, there are some slight differences, but what I found out because I also have some uh, older data sets and actually also from some other countries that yeah. safety, taste, and nutrition are usually within the top three. Not so cheap. that is something sometimes in a bit of a different order, but safety and taste are like, uh, yeah, and nutrition also a few times, those are the ones that are like the top three food values. Mm. Okay. Well, um, I think we have three more minutes. Um, I don't have any questions for um, fellow, you know, speakers. Um, we have any questions for others? Um, Henning or Peng Fei? Mm, no. Okay. All right, well, you know, I, I guess I was, um, uh, Corina and I did like, you know, this tag team of ad hoc moderator and timekeeper. Um, uh, you know, I, this is my uh, first, uh, well, last year also we did the virtual 
presentation, I think, you know, um, I wish uh, we uh, had larger number of people in the audience, but, yeah. you know, yes, that's what you get, what you get, right? Um, but um, uh, thank you everyone for being here and, uh, and uh, your interaction, enjoy your presentation. You all have good day and good evening, whatever you may be. Bye-bye. Thank you. The same to you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Dr. One, goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.